Hi, everyone. <clears throat> We're back with our second half of the morning session, uh, kicking it off with our NFT Real Talk panel hosted by Manish Kumar, joined with, uh, with panelists uh, Miles Anthony, Andre Allen Anjos, Eric, and Eric Pinos. Manish is the founder of Aptiva, a real estate tech uh, leveraging blockchain and AI to automate uh, several points of friction within the real estate uh, business. Manish is also a good friend of the MIT Bitcoin Club. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk, uh, NFTs Real Talk. I have a great panel here with us today with Miles, Andre, and Eric. I'm going to give them a minute to introduce themselves. So, uh, Miles, if you could just start us off. Hey everyone, I'm Miles, founder of Decentral Games. Um, we build games in the metaverse. Um, we have several different NFTs that we've built and, and rolled out for our community and looking forward to talking about it a bit today. Thanks for having me. Hey everyone, uh, this is Andre. I'm, I'm actually a musician. I, I've, I've been making music professionally under the name RAC since 2007. So I've been doing this for a while. Uh, I, I've in the In that process, I've been uh, I guess obsessed with technology, and more recently, that has manifested in uh, in crypto, in Bitcoin and Ethereum since 2017. So, stoked to be here, uh, Eric. You want to take us home? Yeah, welcome, guys. So, my, my name is Eric. I'm president of the Blockchain Education Network, otherwise known as Ben. Uh, we're a worldwide network of student clubs and and professors and alumni around the world that are excited and interested in blockchain of which the MIT Bitcoin Club is, is one of. And that's how I got involved in the space was through the MIT Bitcoin Club initially. So uh, excited to be here. Thanks, guys. I mean, I'm really excited for you folks. We have, you know, Miles has a uh, great exposure to the metaverse and Andre as an artist to NFTs in general. And then Eric, his, uh, his experience as an educator of students all over the world is just invaluable. So let's get started. So you know, I'm going to start off and just talk about what is an NFT. And that's my first question. Eric, if you could start us off and just explain us, you know, explain to us a little bit about what an NFT is. Yeah, so when most people uh, think of NFTs, they think of, of um, you know, of the collectibles and the art that they see kind of in the space. And they see there's beginning a lot of news around it, but kind of on a more like standard or protocol is a, is a, is a type of token that is defined as a non-fungible token. So when you think of like Bitcoin or Ethereum or uh, Litecoin or any other cryptocurrency, usually there's there's tons of them, right, of, of the same kind. So the idea of fungibility says that any one is like any other one. So if you think of like a dollar, if I were to take a dollar and crumple it up or like wherever it came from, you'd still want that dollar because that dollar, all the dollars are the same. Um, same thing with like fungible cryptocurrencies, like one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin, one Ethereum is the same as another Ethereum. It doesn't matter which Ethereum you have, just that you have this amount. For non-fungible tokens, it's different because for non-fungible tokens, each individual token of a specific set has its own unique properties. So this manifests itself usually in, 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 uh, in book format. So like if you have different uh, game assets, each one could look slightly different. Or if you have different art piece, each art piece looks different from every other art piece. Um, but it has the same properties of a, of a cryptocurrency being that it's signed onto the blockchain and it's being transferred, the, the transfer and ownership is being tracked on the blockchain, so you can provably show who owns which particular NFT. So that's what makes it like really exciting for use cases like art and collectibles and game assets and anything that isn't normally covered under the, the typical fungible token. That's great. Anyone now have anything to add to that? My next question is for Miles, if you could start us off and you guys can, you know, all kind of uh, tell us your opinion on this. So are NFTs, you know, is, just, is this just a funny S and SNL skit or, uh, or in a fad or is this something that we have some real technology behind it? You know, um, you know, I know that Miles, you built one of the largest businesses in the metaverse and uh, looking, you know, want to hear your perspective as to, you know, I know you recently added a NFT gallery to that, uh, to, to your metaverse uh, uh, you know, um, space and want to see how that's going and if that's something that maybe could become more of, uh, as successful as your gaming business, you, you know, in your, in your vision down the road. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think NFTs, first of all, are kind of hitting mainstream audience just because of the, um, the ease of use and, and you know, with, with Topshot and some of these other platforms that appeal 
to folks that are not necessarily um, engulfed in the crypto ecosystem. But I think, um, you know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now, you know, with the collectibles art and stuff. I think, you know, as you kind of venture deeper into the ecosystem, you realize that there's a lot more layers that you kind of um, uh, discover. And, you know, one of the things is, is utility based NFTs. So for, for us, you know, actually packing in some utility to the NFT within a game system or um, within a crypto ecosystem, in our case, um, wearing um, our NFTs, they're, they're items of clothing that you can wear on an avatar in, inside the metaverse. You know, it has the, has the utility of actually, you know, being able to wear it. And then also it's, it, it gives you a, a bonus for, for mining our coins. So, so there's a, a direct financial utility. And I'm sure, um, you know, with, with all types of art, you know, I think there's going to be several different um, um, layers of, of utility. Um, for it. I'm, I'm sure that Andre can kind of talk to that a bit more with like the music side of things. I feel like we're just kind of getting started with, um, you know, that kind of, um, you know, angle of NFTs. And I think there'll be a lot more unique um, use cases um, that get, get unveiled over the next few months. Yeah, so, um, no, the, the, the NFT standard has been really interesting to see how it progressed over time, because, you know, th this is something that I, I've been hearing about for a long time, and people have thrown around this idea. It, it's actually really funny to talk to, like, non-crypto people about this, because fungibility is such a, like, a specifically, like, financial term. Like, people don't really, inter like, think about fungibility on their on a daily basis. So even the name non-fungible token is already a confusing starting point for a lot of people. Uh, but I, I think we're kind of at that point where it's it's stuck like the MP3. Like MP3 is not like you know the most obvious name for a music file, but here we are, 20 years later, still talking about it. So uh, you know the the one thing I'll mention is sort of maybe my own experience in discovering NFTs as somebody that as like an artist that that was like into crypto but kind of like almost didn't notice it progress. Um, you know. So I, I was like, I was very into DeFi, uh, very entrenched kind of in the Ethereum ecosystem. And, uh, you know, all this stuff happening over the last summer, like DeFi summer. And and in in the midst of all that, all these platforms like Super Rare, um, Nifty Gateway, uh, Async, Known Origin, there was all these pockets of, uh, of platforms starting with the sole focus on digital art. And um, that's when it really, clicked for me that that um i mean okay so like there, there were other experiments crypto kitties i think we all kind of are aware of a lot of those crypto punks and whatever but um it, it wasn't until like that market started to pop off and that it, it really f felt like it had some legs i guess so it, i think over the past really like six months um, I mean, it started very, very uh, small, but it got to a point where we're having SNL skits about NFTs. Like, let's just take a moment to like, for that to sink in. Cause like th that, that to me is like the ultimate mainstream metric, right? Like if, if SNL is talking about it, it it's not that niche. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's been really interesting to see that progress. And, you know, for example, like a, a, as, as far as like music goes, it's, um, you know, it, even that is still like a novel idea because it started out more as a visual medium, you know, visual art form, adding scarcity to it, uh, people buying and selling stuff. It, it, it's like this market that's going crazy right now. And now I think it's starting to move over into music. And then I think we're going to start to see it to move into all kinds of other assets. Um, and like, like Eric was saying, you know, th this is much bigger than just digital art. This is... Uh, this is like a, a format, you know, it's, it's like a file format almost in a way. Um, and, you know, it, it, I guess like being able to put any kind of data into it, you know, I think we're going to see all kinds of interesting applications, insurance, uh, deeds, I don't know, like property rights. There's all kinds of like really interesting applications for this. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see how it progresses over the next, I don't know, even like two months. I feel like I'm surprised. Eric, do you have a do you have a uh, do you have an idea? You know, do you have an opinion as to where we're headed with NFTs? If this is just a fad or a long-term tech that will be, uh, you know, helping us out in different in different uh, industries and all? Yeah, I think as as was mentioned, right? There's it's not just a fad. I think that uh, the potential for it is is almost limitless. I mean, given that it is a new file format and one that transcends all kinds of media that we already have, like you can link it link it to music. You can link it to um, you know, images and link it to multimedia, even like, like 3D models can be represented as NFTs. Any kind of 
digital media can be represented as NFTs. Any kind of real media can be represented as NFTs, like entering into legal contracts and entering into you know, like insurance plans. Um, and then the whole thing with the, the metaverse and all the digital assets space uh, and the different representation for NFTs, like there's, there's so much utility that can be built on it. Like one of my favorite is um, the virtual land. And so when you own a land NFT, what you really own is a point on a coordinate plane. And so when you own this point on a coordinate plane, you have like different games that can choose to represent that in different ways. So I like that as well, that like you can represent it in different ways in different mediums, um, which I think is something that's kind of under considered, but there's so much potential. And as, as you can see from like the other speakers here, there's business potential as well. So even is not, not, not only is it not a fad, it's also not just like a hobby. There's like actual like business applications and, and this thing can revolutionize, uh, you know, entire industries. Yeah, I love how you guys are really kind of the OGs of this right now. I mean, I know Miles got started early and Andre, I, when I understand you actually launched an NFT back in 2017. That's pretty exciting that uh, the, how far we've come now. And Eric, I know you've been in the space forever. So I uh, love these perspectives. Uh, moving on, uh, we're my next question is for Andre, you know, Grammy award winning artist. Uh, I saw a great tweet from you and I just want to bring it up here that, you know, you had mentioned in your tweet that, you know, um, you had sold three albums over ten year over a ten year period, and uh, your most recent launch actually gave you the artist uh, a better return than that ten years of work. And to me, uh, and a lot of the folks here at the MIT Bitcoin Club, which I love, uh, you know, uh, we're a lot about we really care a lot about decentralization and uh, the empowerment of the individual. And uh, you know, so can you can you tell us a little bit about that and how you've been able to leverage NFTs and artists, and maybe even speak to the artists that are out there about how maybe they could uh, also kind of uh, take advantage of this? Yeah. So um, yeah, maybe I'll just to back up for a quick second. I'll give it some context of like how I got to that. But 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 um, you know, so again, I've been a musician for for a long time, and and I, I went maybe not the most traditional route, but I went I went kind of I worked through the system. I was signed to a major label. I was signed to indie labels. You know, I kind of did all the things. I, I I worked with everybody. I I got screwed over. Like you know, like the classic like music industry thing. Uh, and just for people that aren't aware, like the music industry is quite toxic. It's uh, they they take I think on average like uh, eighty percent up uh, out of all uh, income. So it, you know, the artist is left like with a very small, small amount. So it's, it's never been uh, on the recorded music side. It's never been a great source of income. So, you know, I, I think it's always made me somewhat entrepreneurial because I'm like, well, I love making music. I'm going to keep doing it. What other ways can I make income, you know, off of this? And, you know, that, that <laughs> kind of jumping around here, but that, that eventually led me to Ethereum, uh, like in, in 2017, where uh, you know I, I was just playing playing with this technology uh, and enabling, like I I released one of the I guess the first album on Ethereum where you know it was a very simple idea just a smart contract you know uh, if you deposited X amount of ETH you got a zip file sent to you that was hosted on IPFS and that was it you know and in, in the midst of that we also released an ERC twenty token which you know predates the seven twenty one standard but it, it you know is essentially like a collectible you know. So I mean, is that an NFT? I don't know. Like, but but like you know, I, I think the 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 idea was there. You know, um, of, of creating a collectible token that was sort of meant to you know, it was like a proof of purchase, like a stamp in time. You know, so you know, I I, I kept playing around with that. I've I've done various different projects, tokenizing uh, physical cassettes. I I, uh, I I I created a market for a cassette tape that ended up, I think, on the first day had a market cap of $60,000 or something like that ended up selling um, the, the the token ended up being uh, I, I think it, it peaked at around $13,000 so ended up being becoming the most expensive because that type of all time. So my, my point is like, um, I, I like to play with this technology to like basically apply markets to, you know, merch or like anything that's relevant to my own career and really just use the technology as, as a tool and, and, and play with these ideas. So that led me to um, late last year in in really like September, I started to notice the NFT stuff, like kind of like I was mentioning earlier, like the super rares, the nifties of the world. And I was like, okay, well, this is interesting. Let me, you know, how do I, as an artist, like fit into this? You know, like I'm a musician, I'm not a visual artist. So I, I basically um, hit up my, my visual artist friend that I work with a lot. He did my album covers. And I was like, hey, 
you're like a well-known person in the visual arts world. Do you want to collab, collab on something on this NFT thing? He's like, what's that? You know, I was like, no idea. And um, we decided to create basically like a piece of audio visual art. The idea being, you know, okay, like when you go to a museum, I, I spend uh, maybe 30 to 45 seconds, maybe a minute looking at a piece of art and I move on to the next one, you know, uh, so maybe sometimes I spend more, but like for the most part, that's sort of the loop, you know? So the whole idea was like, okay, how do we replicate that loop on, in a digital medium? So, you know, I started to do that and, uh, you know, we, we basically decided, came up with this idea of doing, yeah, 35 to 45 second visual loops, like basically like a scene, you know, like a room. And then with music, I'm setting a tone, I'm setting a, a mood, I guess. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we put it up on super rare, not really thinking anything, you know, I was hoping maybe, I don't know, a thousand bucks or something like that, make some extra income. And uh, it actually broke the record on super rare at the time, a modest $26,000, which uh, at the time was amazing, but like now it, it's sort of pales in comparison to some of the million dollar sales that we've, we're seeing. But, you know, it, it really piqued my interest, obviously, because, you know, here was something that we, we put a lot of effort into it, but the, the financial side of it, the financial upside was so tremendous compared to what we were getting on, you know, Spotify or any other platform like that. So, you know, I kind of continued to, to play with that. And, um, you know, over the course of the past couple months, you know, as, as you guys are well aware, like this, the NFT space has exploded. Uh, Justin Blau made $12 million over a weekend, you know, uh, people 69 million, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of been um, like a, a fascinating ride. And, and to, to put it in perspective, in, in terms of like, compared to like my, my previous albums and all of that, you know, I, I, uh, I, I think the, the amount of money that I generated, first of all, my most recent drop on Nifty uh, made, yeah, made more in, yeah, like a day than I did in 10 years of like working with all the biggest labels, all the like, all the indie labels, all the coolest artists in the world, like all of that added to less than what I made over a weekend with NFTs. So that to me is like, I, I, I don't mean to paint that picture that it's gonna work like that for everybody or anything like that. But what I will say is like the, the amount of sort of financial upside that you have with even just like a minor, minor success is, is tremendous. Um, and even even on my first drop with like 26k or something like that, that's that's a that's a, a a very that's a, a great amount of money that you can get compared to like what you what you'd be getting on on the traditional you know platforms. So so for for musicians and for visual artists especially, I mean this is like a, a renaissance. I mean this is this is an amazing kind of new evolution, and um, I think that's part of the reason why people are so excited about it. Yeah, I love the decentralization aspect of that. Um, but along with that, you know, we don't want to just, you know, shill NFTs. We want to bring real kind of value to our audience today because there is, you know, a um, from a protocol level, you know, uh, a real issue with NFTs where the problem of duplication um, is going to be um, an, an issue for sure. Um, it's not a perfect sort of situation where you have, a, you know, everything with Bitcoin, uh, you have the transaction happen on the, on the blockchain and it's kind of very complete. Uh, NFTs have, um, you know, some trust sort of um, issues still when it comes to how they interact with the blockchain. And I was, um, you know, wanting to get, uh, start with Eric and just get uh, some perspectives on, um, on that from, um, you know, what you think, where you think we're at today and where you think that it can, how you think it can be bettered. I know that there's some, a couple of different ways, whether it's like a, um, you know, kind of uh, a pool of people coming together, a pool of companies coming together and, and creating a standard. But I really want to see this whole decentralized aspect of uh, where we have where we empower the artists and the creators um, to remain. So I'm, I, would, I want to talk about um, a little bit about how we can keep that decentralization and not centralize it to, you know, these uh, sort of minting companies. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think there's, there's a lot of elements of, um, of verification that need to happen. I mean, given that there is trust in NFTs more than like regular tokens would have, um, there have been cases of fraud where you have people uploading files, pretending to be certain artists like they will go to instagram pull someone's some artists like images upload pretending to be that artist 
Um, so a lot of these marketplaces that were mentioned have started rolling out to verification tools, like, oh, verify your identity socially on Twitter or verify it through like this questionnaire or through like this, this Zoom call, like just so that you have like a social verification and then you get the, the check mark, right? And then that check mark shows like, oh, you're actually this artist. So when you're uploading work, you can actually, uh, people can trust that like, oh, this is actually from this artist this is actually from the celebrity. Um, these NFTs actually came from that source. Uh, I think there's also things about like the, the time stamping. So once something's like on chain from a verified artist, if someone else tries to duplicate it, or even if the artist like issues out more, that's another thing with the scarcity is that even if there's like 10 copies of something, there's nothing technically stopping the artist from coming in and minting another 10 or like changing the benefits like oh hey this nft gives you access this is like a concert ticket or something like you know because i think that's a cool use case for nfts is like nfts that give you access to special groups give you access to special events maybe like one-on-one -on -one meetings there's a lot of like fan engagement that can be done with nfts but that's dependent on the artist so there's there's a trust element on the artist or on the issuer that those things are going to be honored um so i don't think the trust is going to like the trust element is going to go away entirely because the nature of nfts is that is about engagement and is about uh, interaction. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't exist in a silo, like just on the chain. So there's always gonna be a need for like verification. There's always gonna be a need for kind of a, a bit of moderation, a bit of curation. And I think that, you know, the platforms and the marketplaces are, are really wrestling with this because on the one hand, they wanna be completely decentralized. You know, everyone can, can create an account and start minting NFTs, buying and selling NFTs, participating in this ecosystem. On the other hand, there's, you know, there's fraud and there's copycats. So like, what do we do? If it's a blockchain, you can't stop them from minting NFTs. But as a, as a company, right, is there, there's the responsibility, is there the responsibility that you should be taking those fraudulent NFTs off, at least on the front end, like stop showing them so that people can't easily find them. I think that that's kind of the compromise that people are coming to because, you know, on a technical level, you really can't stop anyone from coming in and making NFTs. Like it's on the blockchain and you can access the blockchain from anywhere. Yeah, I definitely want to continue this part of the conversation and we want to talk about strengthening decentralized identities and all. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to ask Miles to give us a little walkthrough. I mean, I, you know, we talk so much, but this is this whole space is really about creating. And I want to give our audience a little experience of the metaverse. And um, Miles, you have this incredible um, uh, NFT gallery. And I was wondering if you could, if we could, you know, have you share your screen and walk us through that gallery. Um, be pretty exciting for us and our audience. Oh, great. Thank you. Let's see. Are you guys able to see this on the, on the screen? So yeah, here's like um, one of the NFT galleries that we made. This is just a, an example of kind of just displaying some NFTs in the metaverse. Most of these are art based ones, but it shows kind of, you know, instead of seeing on like a 2D interface on a website, you can display it in 3D. And this is, this is like the building where we kind of host our meetings um, with our community for the DG community. And that's why we were able to put up all these different pieces of art kind of around like this, this area. And so when, when you display it, anyone can click on it and, you know, purchase and, and get linked to the actual um, piece of art. This one's on OpenSea, so you can go directly to it and, and purchase it. But yeah, I think, I think in terms of NFTs in the metaverse, I think it's really, um, you know, I think it's, it provides kind of a, a, a mechanism of displaying it. Like, for example, I know the guy, um, he bought the people is he wants to display it in Decentraland. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll see more and more people kind of building these art galleries. I've seen, you know, I've been part of the Decentraland community for over two years now, three years now. And, um, you know, we see more and more art galleries popping up. And, and really, I think, you know, NFTs give the, the users of these platforms a bit more security and in, in, um, it, it allows them to um, be able to put more and more investment into purchasing items because you know they know that they actually own them um, versus you know in centralized um, virtual worlds when you when you or, or video games when you get items and accrue uh, valuable items over time um, if it's centralized then you know you're kind of at the mercy of whoever's uh, the gatekeeper of that specific platform and so I think you know um, this is really just the first step and you know we've seen like with with what Eric was saying you know virtual land NFTs. Um, folks are spending millions of dollars on, on virtual land. The, the gallery I just showed um, right now, it's just on four parcels of land and the average price right now for, for like each one of these parcels of land is upwards of, you know, 5,000 uh, USD, um, you know, depending on the location. So it's, it's pretty crazy the amount of money investment that 
people are comfortable with putting into these um, pieces of uh, just virtual goods um, and assets. And I think it's it's really you know just getting started. Um, so I'm I'm pretty excited to to see kind of um, you know once the folks that are kind of just getting into NFTs now kind of start to um, experiment with displaying them in the metaverse and and kind of exploring the metaverse. And that's kind of where um, you know my my project comes in. You know we're we have a pretty big metaverse presence. Um, and so yeah. Dude, that yeah, I wanted to add so... the virtual goods. Oh, sorry. Dude. What was that? No, please go ahead, Eric. Uh, I wanted to add that virtual goods. I mean, that's already a huge, huge industry. And if you look at things like you know the the secondary marketplaces for like Fortnite skins, they're like twelve year olds making money. Uh, selling and buying and selling and, and being entrepreneurial around that. And I mean, the value of Fortnite skins actually went down a lot after Fortnite came out and took a bunch of the like the initial base sets and just released them all again. Because uh, it's like, oh, let's, these were great. Let's release them again, make more money. But you just like cut this, you doubled the, the supply and then you know, the market kind of reacted to that. So with NFTs, you kind of can avoid that things from happening because even if they were to create more, you can't replicate the initial set. It's like the base set. And so there's value in just knowing that you have from the base set, even if the visual elements are the same. And also, I mean, I think one of the stories with Vitalik and I, 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 I imagine this is true. I don't know, but maybe it's like a myth that people keep perpetuating around. But one of the reasons that he created Ethereum was because he was a World of Warcraft player or one of those like games like that. And then they changed the rules on one of his favorite spells. And so he's like, oh, the, what was the point of like hours and hours and days and days of grinding if they're just going to change all the rules around there? They're going to change the assets and just drop more. Like you spend forever trying to get these these game assets and then they just they duplicate them. So, um, you know, just for games alone, like that's that's a lot of people are coming into the space now, not as like blockchain people, not as cryptographers, but as like game designers and game developers. So what I really like about NFTs is that there's such a wide appeal and it's going to bring so many new kinds of people into the space. And I think it really is going to be like a renaissance of like all these new ideas that, that previously people that were very like financial focused or very like, you know, cryptography focused, very economic focused, we hadn't been, we haven't been considering. Um, and now these new people coming in are going to bring those ideas too. I was going to say, Miles, that was awesome. That looked, that was incredible. Your gallery was dope. I um, wanted to, and I want to get back to our um, decentralized identity stuff. So I personally, you know, think that uh, instead of empowering institutions uh, to center, to, to decide what the norms will be uh, going forward to, um, you know, protect consumers. Uh, I think uh, some of the ideas behind decentralized identity and strengthening individuals at decentralized identity to make them a trust, you know, known as trustworthy uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and uh, your opinions on, on, on decentralized identity. Uh, you, you know, uh, just to sort of piggyback off of what Eric was saying about de decentralized identity, because he brought up a lot of interesting issues that I think are happening right now that we're basically kind of figuring out in real time, you know, this is, uh, it's like markets at work, I guess, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of an artist minting their work more than once, you know, uh, while, while, while it's, um, it's definitely possible, you know, like you can technically do it. Uh, I, I, I'd argue that um, there's actually like a real real strong disincentive reputationally you know because like as, as an artist like you're gonna hurt your rep reputation in the community by doing so lowering your prices overall and it feels like uh almost like if people do that it's like very short-term kind of gains kind of a thing and they're not really thinking about it long term of course they, they can and they probably there probably will be people that continue to do that but um like for example, like me, I'm I'm very much uh, opposed to doing that because like I know that people are watching. You know, people will be aware of it. Um, the 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 identity layer is really interesting because I, I've been again because we're we're figuring this out as we go. I what what I've personally tried to do is is basically uh, be very public about my my public Ethereum address. So rac.eth, like that's my public address. Everybody knows it. I have I have it in my Twitter uh, bio. You know, so if that's sort of a very loose form of of verification. It's obviously not like a platform or nobody's checking really. But um, that's sort of a way for me to be preemptive, maybe to be like, okay, if you're gonna buy an authentic <laughs> NFT from me or something like that, then 
like double check it's this address you know uh like I, I feel like there's sort of like a like a kind of a communal responsibility to make sure you know especially if you're going to drop like a decent amount of money you know do some due diligence on it um you know it's it's uh that, that's sort of how i'm personally tackling it um but I, i've you know i don't think that that's a perfect solution because uh you know it's sort of relying on, on social norms it's not very crypto you know it's like you, you kind of want there to be sort of a trustless system that really can can verify it and 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 that would that would be ideal um so uh, i guess like we're we're kind of figuring this out as we go and there's been like a, a lot of people trying to do you know the identity side of it and like it's 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 hard because like, you kind of need to get everybody on it and and it's 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 weird in the interim you know when not everybody is using it um so i don't know it's it's a tricky problem but i i think it'll sort of i, th I think it'll manifest itself like slowly over time I'm, I'm i'm curious to see how you guys are thinking about that right Eric, by the way another great call. use case and then another after, great after, use case after this we're going to start our q a so um uh, eric please finish up on that topic thanks sure yeah uh another use case for uh nfts uh the domain names so rac.eth eric.eth blockchain.eth i that's something that already kind of wants to be nfts but if you look at domain names now, there's registrars. There's like two different registrars you got to register from. You lease it from them. It, that's a digital asset. People think digital assets are stupid. Do you own a domain name, bro, for your website? If you do, then congratulations. You have a digital asset that's purely digital asset. But yours is like encompassed in all these like weird regulatory bodies that have to try to like keep sure that you own it. Just put it on a blockchain and then ownership is taken care of. You don't need any auditors because you can verify who owns it. So I think that that's incredible potential for like something that, you know, that's real, like a very real thing, the domain names. Um, yeah, I mean, as as the, as you said, for identity, that's something we all got to figure out. I think that the the ideal solution is is no particular solution, right? It's just like a, like an ecosystem of, of decentralized identity verifiers so that people can verify their identities in different ways. And it's more like strengthening your identity, the more types of verification that you do. So there's like a subgraph for it. So rather than, oh, everyone needs to socially verify or everyone needs to KYC or everyone needs to, um, you know, civil verify themselves by attending a thing. You could have different points of identity and people can strengthen their decentralized identity like passport by choosing to verify themselves in different ways. That way there's consent. Everyone has the consent for like how they choose to verify themselves and what data they choose to share. Um, you know, this kind of system is really, can really only be done on a blockchain. So I think that that's, it goes along nicely that NFTs can plug into the, the decentralized identity ecosystem that's also kind of being built up in parallel to this. That's great. Miles, I just want to give you a chance. I mean, if you have an opinion on the metaverse and how we are decentralizing identities in the metaverse, I didn't want to miss that point on from your perspective. No, yeah, I think, I mean, I think Andre and Eric really hit upon all the main the key points. I think um, it's, it's good to have all these different um, inputs uh, that kind of give uh, points to um, someone's identity and kind of build it up. Um, I don't think it's really um, a good idea to rely on one in particular. So I think that's a great approach. And, you know, the beauty of Ethereum too is you are able to, you know, create a new address, you know, and, be, you know, pretty much create like a new um, identity essentially by just minting or creating a new address. So I think, you know, it is, it, it is really important to um, have these mechanisms to prove that someone is legitimate. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think Eric and, and Andre really hit upon pretty much all the main key points that I would, would cover in that. Yeah. Great. I'm going to give you each about a minute to answer these questions from our audience. I don't mean to rush, but we are, we don't want to hold up, um, you know, the Bitcoin club moving on with the event. So let's start with when selling an NFT, does it mean you give up the copyright to the image? For example, selling an image of a painting, what happens to the original physical painting? Who wants so, to take so, that? So, so uh, th there's um, typically, uh, again, like you, you can sort of imbue what you want into an NFT. I mean, within reason, of course. Uh, but uh, typically, there's no copyright. There's no exchange of uh, intellectual property. Um, you know, the in fact, most of the terms of services that you you know, if you're buying something from Super Rare or Nifty, I keep using those as examples, but there's like a whole bunch of them. But you know, there's no exchange of of IP. So unless specifically, you know, unless it's like unless the artist like really wants to do that and even then it's not really enforceable so that kind of opens up a, like a can of worms but uh not not 
not by default. Definitely not. Miles, Eric, do you guys want to provide some answers? I just want to I just want to point out that you know there is one aspect of copyright that people have to understand, and that is that the blockchain is not going to guarantee your copyright. The United States Copyright Office also does not guarantee your copyright. You have to protect your copyright yourself. You have to defend it yourself, and that's something that I think artists all need to understand um, that that onus does fall on you, um, even with with these things. The other thing is that you know, uh, right now, the current situation is that you are left to sort of uh, police the blockchain for duplicates. We're hoping that, you know, this like trust systems that were that, that will come about in the future will help with this. But the current situation is such that if some, you know, you have to trust the person, the creator that you're buying from. It's great that we have uh, Andre here who has, you know, uh, provided like some kind of promises to his community but uh it, it does fall on you as the as the investor when you buy those things so i didn't want to just um you know i wanted to make sure that we that we made those points uh the next question we have is what should be encoded in the nft what if host server dies or blockchain discontinues should hash of binary be defined should the actual file be hosted on the chain it seems no clear definition or standards and confidence for permanence. Eric, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So a lot of the initial NFTs um, would encode, they would encode hashes and strings in the, in the NFT itself. And so those hashes would point to a server and then that would generate the image, for example, like CryptoKitties. Um, but you're right that there's like an issue that if this, if that server goes down or if it, something changes, then it breaks. And so now it's like, you still have the hash, right? And you still have the NFT, but it no longer like generates that image or no longer points to the image. So more recently, um, people have been storing the images on, on IPFS, right? And so like, or, or on, on uh, Skynet and like doing this decentralized storage. So I think similarly, like how the verification is happening in parallel for like the decentralized identity ecosystem, there's also the decentralized storage ecosystem that's kind of coming up alongside the NFT space. So, you know, all of these revolutions that are happening right now, um, they don't happen in isolation. So it kind of all happens at the same time. So at the same time that we're figuring out NFTs, we're also figuring out, okay, how do you store these so that, um, so that it's, you know, stays there forever. Um, and I mean, like the most embedding the image itself into an NFT is probably like the least best solution because that's a lot of, of data to be putting onto a blockchain. So that's going to make gas costs really high. So I think there's a lot of collaboration between decentralized storage projects and, and NFT projects to try to like, oh, let's have our images stored on IPFS. So that's decentralized as well. Uh, and then the NFTs will point to those images and then that's a link that can't be broken. Exactly. I think this also kind of applies with uh, uh, virtual land as well. I mean, there's a few different projects that have virtual land, but um, you know, Decentraline is one of the projects where the actual hosting of the land is decentralized. So it's not like it's just pointing to one server and then that server has kind of like a map of the land and that signifies exactly which piece of land that you own. In Decentraline, there's 12 different nodes. We actually, my company actually hosts one of the nodes um, to help, you know, secure the, the, um, the hosting of all the content and, and ensure that it's decentralized. So, you know, for, for whatever reason, Decentraline team um, ceases to um, operations and development, you know, this NFT is still, you know, worth something because it corresponds to a piece of digital land that's decentralized in its hosting. So it's not like reliant on the actual, um, you know, company of the center project of the central land to give it like purpose and, and utility. So I think that's really important too. Like when, when folks are looking at, you know, purchasing NFTs, you know, if it actually has utility, you know, what happens if the product, if the, the platform that it's, has utility on, you know, shuts down for whatever reason, or the team ceases to development. I think um, that's something that definitely, for, for me, it, it definitely adds a lot of value to the actual NFT, knowing that, you know, it's um, decentralized in the hosting of the, of the content. And that applies to um, the art as well. Yeah, there's a whole field of NFT archaeology right now where people are going back to like really old NFT projects and seeing some of them are broken, some of them are still around. But if you if you set it up properly, you can deploy an NFT project, link to the images on IPFS or whatever decentralized storage platform you want, set it all up, set up all the rules, 
and then walk away and then just leave it. And then it kind of grows itself. And there's like a whole ecosystem of people around it. I think that's one of the really cool things. Like you're creating these things that kind of take on a life of their own. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I'm excited when we empower the artists to actually do that and serve those things themselves. I think that's going to be the best case scenario. Um, all right, next we have, could you please elaborate how exactly the NFT music works for the users? Why it works better than the traditional format for both artists and audience? Is it to pay for the same experience that we have in Spotify, but on a fancy platform? <laughs> So I, I have lots of opinions on this one. Uh, <laughs> but, but basically, um, think of it this way: like, zoom out a little bit. Like, okay, like, what, what do we, what do we have right now? Um, we have Spotify is a reaction to piracy. Like, the the only reason that we have Spotify, I mean, literally, it, the Daniel Eck, the founder of Spotify, was at uTorrent before, you know. So so there, there's a clear path here uh, that Spotify emerged as as a solution, really. For the music industry to solve piracy, because they, they, uh, they were they were still trying to apply like an old world model to to music. So they were essentially trying to apply like a, uh, yeah, like I said, like an old world model to to something digital that can be infinitely copyable. So th this created this really bizarre system where we're trying to price like a digital asset that can be infinitely copyable. And, and we basically just added enough friction, you know, through ads or through subscription fees to monetize that. And I, the, in my view, that, that's sort of the incorrect model for the internet. So what, what I, I think that NFTs, uh, what, what, what they do that's really interesting to me is that they actually open up access to everybody. What it says is like, hey, you can access it for free, like have it, enjoy it enjoy music, you know, you should, it, it's like a part of like the human experience, you know, it, it, by all means, enjoy it. But the ownership of that asset uh, is scarce. So I, I think that that, again, I'm not sure it's like a perfect exact model for all of music, but it's a very interesting counterpart to what we have currently, because it couldn't, it's like the polar opposite. So, you know, I, I think like how this actually becomes like a consumer experience, I, I, I don't know, but like we needed to really change that fundamental model of like how we monetize this stuff because like what we have now with Spotify is not working. It's it's gonna be uh, like, I don't know what Spotify is gonna do, but like literally every single artist, every single um, musician that I know is not happy and uh, something is gonna, gonna give at some point. I mean, I think to, to some extent the, the success of NFTs are a reaction to to that sort of model breaking down. Um, so I like again, again, like it's it's not necessarily trying to replicate the the Spotify experience because actually, to be fair, the consumer experience of Spotify is amazing. I mean, fifteen bucks and you get all access to all music. You know that that's kind of cool. But you know, uh, I think it needs to work on both ends. And um, you know, I think the, the the emergence of NFTs, especially with audio and and, and music NFTs are really sort of paving that way to really try to figure out a different model that, that works where, again, uh, everybody gets access, free access, but the ownership of it is scarce. And the idea being that, um, you know, if a song uh, sort of, if it becomes sort of a cultural, you know, if it has enough cultural relevance, then the value will accrue to that ownership. So that's that's kind of the general idea. I, 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 can't, I can't say for sure how it's going to shake out, but like that's, that's kind of how I'm thinking this this will progress. I think that's great. I, I just wanted to thank you guys uh, for being here with us today. I also really wanted to tell everyone in the audience that please, you know, take the, this uh, uh, this opportunity to visit the metaverse in Gather Town, where we have uh, a great setup of MIT campus, uh, you know, Killian Court and all. It's going to be awesome. Please take the time to log in. The MIT Bitcoin Club Committee. Uh, these folks. Uh, you know, I think we all we all just worked really, really hard to put this together. So we hope that you'll take full advantage of uh, everything that's there for your, um, you know, for your viewing pleasure. Uh, thank you all for being here and um, looking forward to the rest of the talks for the rest of the day.